Hello. Hello, everybody. So good to see so many familiar faces. Give a few more seconds for uh, a few more people in the waiting room that are, that are joining us now. Welcome to Thursdays with Friends, episode 20. Wesley, you're muted. Ha ha. Well, great. I, I'll get it even better the second time. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Thursdays with Friends. I was just giving everyone a, time, a little bit of extra time to join us from the waiting room. Welcome to our 20th episode of Thursdays with Friends. Today is January 21st, 21, 2021. Uh, Thursdays with Friends is our online conversation on current issues, and yesterday, if you didn't have a chance to see, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were sworn in as the 46th president and the 49th vice president. It was mostly virtual inauguration, starting with a vigil remembering the more than 400,000 people in America who have died from COVID-19. I'm the show's producer, Wesley Wolfbear Pinkham. Here's our chat host for Thursdays with Friends, FCNL General Secretary, Diane Randall, and all of our guests today, Diana Olbaum and Amelia Kagan, FCNL's top lobbyists. Over to you, Diane. Thank you, Wesley, and welcome everyone. Uh, great to be with you on this Thursday in January. It is a sunny day here in Washington, DC, and uh, we are hoping that uh, the National Guard forces will be leaving soon. It's been a very tense time here. Uh, but we are pretty excited to bring you this program today. Um, as Wesley said, uh, obviously, I'm sure all of you followed the news and probably watched TV as I did for a, portion, a good portion of the day yesterday um, as Joe Biden and Kamala Harris uh, took their oaths of office. Um, Amelia and Diana, I think you know they've been on this uh, Thursdays with friends with us, but you also know their work from their writing. Uh, Diana Olbaum is the legislative director for our foreign policy program, and Amelia Keegan is legislative director for our domestic policy programs. And um, I was thinking beforehand, like their collective years of experience on the Hill uh, would be pretty, pretty, uh, pretty old. So I don't feel like I need to say that, but they both bring um, a lot of experience of knowledge, both as subject areas as well as the political happenings on the Hill. So together they wrote this blog post that I think we're gonna put in the chat, um, the first hundred days of the Biden administration. Because when a new president comes in, it's obviously very exciting. There's, there's gonna be change. Um, and as you know, we work um, with the administration in some ways, but we also work with Congress primarily. So we're gonna talk about what the administration might do. Um, and we're also gonna talk a little bit about a legislative uh, ask, a congressional ask. Um, I wanna be clear that this um, blog post and what you're gonna hear today is not the entirety of what FCNL works on. We would need a couple of hours to get through everything. So we're gonna start with, um, with uh, foreign policy. And um, I just say, before, before we go there, I wanna note that as I think most of you observed, in addition to having a new president and vice president, we also have a new Congress. And yesterday, three new senators were sworn in um, historic uh, representation, uh, first black senator from Georgia, first Jewish senator from Georgia, and first uh, Latino uh, senator from California. So very, very exciting. And we now have a 50-50 split. So um, if you watched, I just have to say that if you didn't see Amanda Gorman, and if you did see Amanda Gorman, the poet, go back and watch it again, because that is inspiration uh, for the ages. So um, just had to put that little plug in there. All right, Diana, let's start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about where, where your team, what's the foreign policy team see as the top three priorities in this first hundred days for uh, President Biden? Thanks so much, Diane, and hello, everybody. Of course, there is a huge long list of things we'd like to see the Biden-Harris administration do right away on foreign policy, but our top three recommendations are these. The first is we want President Biden to extend the New START Treaty for five years without conditions. 
and it's going to expire on February 5th. So he's going to need to act very quickly on that. And the good news is he says he wants to do that. Uh, the second thing is we want uh, the United States to return to compliance with the Iran nuclear agreement in, uh, uh, in exchange for Iran doing the same. They comply and we comply and we're both back in it. And the third thing is we would like uh, President Biden to end all U.S. support for the war against the Houthis in Yemen. And that means halting all the arms sales now underway to Saudi Arabia and the, U the United Arab Emirates, as well as stop providing operational support for, the, for their bombing campaign. Okay, so uh, we've had the president in office for 28 hours. <laughs> How far have we gone with these? Or what's the status of these three priorities as far as you can see from what's happened or what, what you're hearing? Well, I think there's um, a press conference. Uh, we're back to having press conferences again, a wonderful thing going on right now where we may get some more updates. But we've heard today that President Biden has said he's ready to uh, extend the New START Treaty for all five years, which is fantastic. Because even just a couple of days ago, there were some concerns that top advisors were telling him not to go for the full five years. It looks like this is gonna happen. Um, on uh, the Iran nuclear agreement that we need some more work on, which is why that's going to be um, what we ask uh, of you today, if you would like to take action with Congress, because um, they're saying it's going to be very hard. And yes, it will be hard, but they need to do it right away because Iran is going to have elections and they're likely to elect hardliners and it will be much harder after they are elected. And the third thing on the, on the Yemen war, we're hearing all the right signals from the administration, the uh, nominees for the State Department um, uh, and uh, Director of National Intelligence have all indicated they're, they're ready to stop this support for this war. Um, and we're hoping that it won't be long at all before they actually put it into action. And meanwhile, Congress is moving with resolutions of disapproval. And so that will be moving on a parallel track. And I'll just note that we do have two legislative asks, one foreign policy and one domestic, but there are many more legislative asks that will appear on our website. So I know you see them when we send out email, but please stay tuned because there's, there's a lot of things that we can be doing and talking to our own members of Congress. I also just want to give a shout out um, to the um, uh, event that Sarah Avery posted in the chat. Uh, event that's happening tonight. Uh, the Colorado advocacy team is hosting a uh, talk, which is a really powerful group of speakers, including our own Hassan El Tab. Um, but if you really are interested in learning more about um, the Iran nuclear deal and the status, these would be this would be a great event to go to. So thank you very much for that, Sarah, and for all your work uh, on this issue. Um, let's turn to domestic. Um, Amelia, uh, what would you like to uh, share about the top three priorities on the domestic side? Thanks, Diane. And first, let me say just what a joy it is to be with all of you today. And um, certainly, given what this country has experienced over the past year, the past four years, um, as you can imagine, there is a lot of work to do. Um, and our re uh, recommendations, which you can find on the website, really do reflect that. You know, the good news is President Biden has is moving, he's moving fast. And has already enacted some of our top recommendations. So this includes things like rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement, restoring DACA protections, uh, lifting the travel ban. And uh, one thing that didn't get uh, much news coverage given everything else going on, amazingly, the Trump administration in its final hours actually withdrew two of the very harmful proposals to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. So we are, we're already running strong in our, in our recommendations. Um, but clearly there's still so much more to be done. You know, Trump just issued so many harmful regulations and rolled back so many important regulations, right? So we really need President Biden to reverse course on so many of these things. It includes repealing the public charge rule that denies green cards to immigrants who access public benefits that they are legally entitled to. Uh, includes things like reinstating 
so many environmental protections, right? Regulations around the Clean Air Act, mercury emissions, NEPA review, fuel emission standards, air toxins, and more. Uh, and it includes things like reversing Trump's on immigrate, Trump's immigration policies that have really made our refugee and asylum programs really unrecognizable. And so those are just a few examples, but I invite you to look at the entire list uh, of our top priorities on our website. Thank you very much, Amelia. And it is, a, it is really ambitious and it is very encouraging to us to see the actions that this administration is taking already. We know that we're not gonna agree with everything this administration does. And we also know that it's going to be imperative for Congress to act, that some things can be done by executive order, but there is a lot that has to be done with the authority of Congress. And we believe in that authority. Um, and you're gonna hear more from us over the coming months about that. So we would like you to stay very engaged by talking to your own members of Congress. Amelia, let me stay with you for a minute. Talk, let's talk a little bit about one of these crises that you know, is honest. Is, I mean, and you have talked about this over the last nine months as we've tried to look at what has to be done to provide COVID relief. Um, and the economic um, devastation for, for many households continues for those without income. So given what did pass Congress already, and given that the, the Biden administration has already proposed a, a new rescue package, uh, tell us a little bit about the status of that and what that's going to mean in terms of um, not just what Biden proposed, but what Congress will need to do. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So I think, as you all know, COVID, Congress passed this COVID relief bill at the end of December. Really, really important, huge win. Um, but that was really just a patch to get us through the next couple of months, and so much more assistance is needed. So Biden uh, released last week the um, his American Rescue Plan. It's a very strong proposal, um, but it is a plan. It, it'll be up to Congress to actually turn this into legislation. Um, but it is very solid, very strong. Not only would it extend a lot of the critical benefits that are set to expire, like enhanced uh, unemployment insurance, nutrition assistance, housing assistance, paid leave, which actually already expired, childcare. It also includes some broader structural reforms that to really address some of the inequities uh, that COVID really laid bare. It does things like raise the minimum wage. And one of, I have to say, one of the most exciting provisions in this plan uh, or expansions to the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit, two of America's largest and most powerful anti-poverty programs. And by expanding these tax credits, particularly on the child tax credit uh, expansions, that would cut child poverty nearly in half. That is huge. Uh, so, but we don't have a lot of time. Uh, as I said, some of these benefits are set to expire in mid-March. And we need to do all that we can to really meet this moment and pass a very robust COVID relief bill that, that truly addresses the scope of the crisis. So that's where your voice is so, so important right now. And members of Congress really need to hear about from you about the urgency of passing this sort of relief bill. Thanks, Amelia. Um, and I just, I wanna underscore that because I, I do feel that uh, sometimes I think you all are <clears throat> such excellent advocates and sometimes it may feel like we're re repeating the same ask again and again, or didn't we just do that a few months ago? Um, but the fact is that the, the crisis hasn't been resolved in terms of the economic crisis ahead of us. And so this legislation will be very, very important and will need a heavy lift. So I hope you'll take action on this. Before I turn back to Diana to share a little bit more about the foreign policy side, I do want to invite uh, those of you on the call uh, or on the on the Zoom call to put questions in the chat. Um, we also have a few people on Facebook and on YouTube, and if we have any questions coming in from those platforms, I'll ask staff to help us um, get those questions in the chat. But we'd love to be able to take uh, questions before we end at 4:30. Um, Diana, tell us a little bit more about the the foreign policy side because I know there's a there's a perspective on COVID from that view as well. Yeah, absolutely. Because as the COVID-19 pandemic rages around the world, 
we have not only a moral obligation, but clear self-interest in helping other countries respond to the crisis. We can't protect ourselves unless we're also helping other countries to respond. But unfortunately, the COVID relief package that um, was passed in December, um, it, it did include a very small amount for Gavi, the Global Vaccine Alliance, um, for four billion. Four billion may sound like a lot, but in the uh, in the size of a package that was uh, over a trillion, um, that really isn't very much. Um, we had asked for 20 billion for global, global COVID relief this year. Um, the House had passed 10 billion, um, and in the end, we just got the four. Um, the good thing is that the Biden administration has said that they they recognize this and they are going to be investing in the, uh, in the global side and hopefully they will also do things like waive sanctions against uh, Iran, North Korea that are preventing um, uh, COVID supplies from reaching their populations and also allowing the International Monetary Fund to release uh, funds so that these uh, governments can address their economic crises. Thank you, Diana. Um, so this is a question really to both of you, and it's from Joanne Warner out in Portland. And the question is, do these asks relate more to the House side or to the Senate? So you can talk a little bit about process for it. Particularly, why don't we go back to you, Amelia, and start with the COVID bill, and then we'll come back to Diana and talk about the, the Iran um, JCPOA bill, or not a bill, but the JCPO and what, and what Congress can do and what the president needs to do. Yeah, so for um, the COVID relief bill, I mean, at this point, we really do need uh, advocacy in both the House and the Senate. Um, and they're trying to, you know, Biden has said that he really wants to try and move this package with bipartisan support. And that's, that's going to be hard. And so at this point, really trying to get as many members of Congress to be supportive of as robust a package as possible. That being said, we know that it will be a much uh, bigger, bigger challenge to get it moved in the Senate. Uh, so certainly if you're gonna choose one chamber, probably the, the Senate, but, but at this point, uh, advocacy in both chambers is, is really important. And Diana, tell us a little bit about the timing and what, what's the action that the executive has to take and what's the action that Congress does or doesn't need to do around the JCPOA? Yeah, I'd really like to focus on Congress here because I, I noticed one of the comments in the chat that it sounds like um, that, you know, it's preaching to the choir in the blue states. And I want to emphasize that it is not preaching to the choir. The people that we are most worried about with Iran are three Democratic senators, uh, Coons, Menendez and Cardin, and um, they opposed the Iran nuclear deal initially, um, or else they have been very um, uh, skeptical about it, and they want to make it difficult for the president to re-enter the deal. And so we have work to do on the Democratic side to make sure that they do not erect obstacles in the way of the president re-entering this deal. And I think it's relevant to say that for those of us who care deeply about peace and care deeply about diplomacy, this is taking us back to where we were four years ago. And the world has changed in that time. And so there are some real challenges. <coughs> and we are looking at those in other areas of our work. But um, so building support from both, uh, certainly from those Democrats, but even, you know, it doesn't hurt to reach out to the Republicans and, and talk to them about this because we believe that this is a way that um, we move toward peace and that we avoid war. It is, it is really an essential move. So I, I can't uh, say enough that, that I think if, if particularly the people from Maryland, we need your help. Um, and Delaware. And uh, what was the third one? Maryland, Delaware? Menendez. Menendez in New Jersey. Jersey. Okay, so thank you. And, um, uh, that, that's great. Do we have any other questions that have come in, Wesley? Anything that people have put in the chat? Yeah, um, there's a few different uh, questions about whether, like, um, what are re-entering the World Health Organization um, would mean to, uh, I guess, the, the worldwide response to the pandemic. 
Diana, you want to take? This? Yeah, I'm, and I'm so thrilled. That is one of the things that uh, President Trump did on his first day. Say so we're re-entering health organization, but also working to reform it because we know it's not a perfect institution. But we need to work with them and with the rest of the world to monitor, uh, respond to the virus effectively. So, uh, you know, just the willingness. To, uh, to reach out and participate with the rest of the world in a constructive uh, and peaceful manner is, is, is a sea change. And uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm really excited. It's not gonna, by itself, that's not gonna end the COVID crisis, but it's, a, it's an important first step. Um, it, it's, it's really, an, um, this has just been in many ways a very challenging month given the insurrection on January 6th and then to have this week with this flurry of actions coming from the new administration and kind of a sense of hope but also knowing that there's going to be some real walls and some some challenges ahead um, but I just want to come back to the need for um, I was I was corresponding with someone today about climate change and I said we're really thrilled that we're re-entering the Paris Climate Accord and we're thrilled about you know re, you know pulling back on the Keystone pipeline but ultimately we need Congress to act to reduce carbon I mean that that just really has to be something that happens and, and we'll continue to press for our price on carbon and we'll continue to press for those long-term solutions so I just um, want to make sure that people know that um, this is going to be a long-term <laughs> advocacy piece of work um, Amelia, do you want to say anything? There was somebody just asked about the Problem Solvers Caucus. I, I know we've been hearing um, on the news a lot of times if you're there interviewing a member of Congress, it's often someone from the Problem Solvers Caucus. Can you say something about that group, that caucus? Sure. The Problem Solvers Caucus is a caucus of moderate Republicans and Democrats uh, in the House. And they, uh, yeah, they try and find bipartisan solutions to a lot of the, the issues that are that are uh, up before Congress. So they are oftentimes key members for any sort of uh, issue you're trying to get bipartisan support for. You kind of I mean, especially in the, if you remember in the, they came out with a, a COVID proposal. It didn't really go very far, but it helped spur some negotiations. And then later the Senate sort of equivalent, they don't have an official caucus, um, kind of pick that up. And, and so I, I would say, those moderate members tend to be will be very, very important to advance legislation um, in the work that we're doing. Uh, so I, I, going back to the conversation around, you know, well, maybe I live in a blue state or, or my, my members are, are Democrats. The margins are very, very tight in both the House and the Senate. And in the Senate, even if you can move things through reconciliation, which only require 51 votes, every single Democrat still has a veto on that bill. So um, it, is, it's, it is still gonna be a challenge and there's gonna be a lot of work to try and make sure that you've got support um, for legislation moving through. So uh, that, that's a quick explanation of the Problem Solvers Caucus and, and where we are in terms of the dynamics in, in Congress. Yeah, I think Diana's example of the Iran deal is a great example of like not having every Democrat necessarily with us. And so those conversations are important. Um, I don't know whether either of you, Diana, do you have a, a feeling about um, uh, whether if, if people who are like from blue states, can you say anything about how members influence each other? Um, and particularly in this kind of polarized environment, I know we're almost in a new environment now because of the the insurrection, but what's the, how, how might that help for people to continue talking to their members, even though their members might already agree with them? Yeah, I, I don't think people perhaps understand how much certain members listen to each other. You, the, the bottom line is you can't be an expert in everything. And so members tend to have areas where they're, they know the most, they, uh, uh, care the most and, and they're the most and other members follow behind them and we I'll just give you an example of Sheldon Whitehouse and uh, and Senator Reed in Rhode Island Reed you know since he chairs the uh, now now chairs the Senate Armed Services Committee White House anytime you he's like well I, I just do whatever Reed tells me I mean he's almost that bold about it and I know you know when I worked in the Senate, 
Um, my, the Senator I worked for was very involved in uh, Eastern Mediterranean issues. And I had about 10 offices that would call me every day and say, what's your boss doing? What's your boss doing? Because they would just follow and do whatever he said. So um, if you have uh, you know, a, a, a member who's a leader, one thing they can do is reach out to others um, or you can point members who are not active to get in line behind the ones who are. And I just want to add that one of the this, one of these questions was coming from a friend in, in Massachusetts, and we kind of know that there are a lot of uh, strong leadership, strong leadership on a lot of issues we care about in Massachusetts. But there are also people who are sitting on committees where um, they might have a particular influence. Um, I know we mentioned the name of Representative Seth Molden is someone who's uh, important, and I think there's somebody in Western Mass. Anyway, I, if people are curious about like their specific rep on a particular issue, we can also provide some information for that. Um, so you can know more about what you can do, but don't, don't think that you have to, I mean, we do know that it's always the best to talk to the people who represent you, not to talk to the people in Georgia if you live in Connecticut. And so, um, but you can talk to your friends who live in Georgia and get them to talk to their members of Congress. That's really important. Um, I, so I see Stephen, thank you for putting the Problem Solvers Caucus in the chat if, if people want to know a little bit more about that group. Um, and uh, let me say that it looks like there's another question. How do I know if my legislator is an influencer? How do I know sort of what the role is that my lawmaker may play? Um, opposed to just like talking to someone at FCNL, but what's the best way to get that information? Um, uh, Diana, do you want to take that question? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if there's a really easy way, but you, you can usually tell who are the most um, influential just by how much they talk about it and how much they get in the news on it. I mean, that's a quick proxy for how, um, how involved someone is. Um, uh, but otherwise you just have to do the research, but we're always happy to tell you if you wanna say like, who are the leaders on ending endless war? We can rattle off the list of names of members who are leading and you might not just, you might not know that just from reading the newspaper. So that's, that's what we're here to help with. Okay. I, I would also add, I mean, it's not always a direct correlation, but their committee assignments can sometimes give you an in indication of kind of where their expertise might lie. And certainly if they're a chair or ranking member of a committee that's, um, they, they certainly have influence or a leadership position, um, certainly have a lot of influence there. And, and I'll just add that, you know, we have a lot of different kinds of ways that we try to encourage people to advocate. Certainly our advocacy teams are groups of people locally who are working and they, they really do kind of get to know and build relationships with those offices. And so they actually get to know the staffers in the offices and can kind of get information from them. And that's a very powerful way to, to build a, a relationship. So um, we um, actually just, I see Jim's putting in the, the chat, the uh, focus on ending endless war. We, we think there's some real momentum to repeal 2002 AUMF this year and are very excited about that work. So you'll be seeing more about that um, uh, in the future weeks from FCNL. So listen, we're about out of time here, but I want to offer both Diana and Amelia an opportunity to say anything else they'd like to about the first 100 days of the Biden administration or our specific asks. Um, what are you looking forward to here? Um, Amelia, why don't you go ahead first? Sure, yeah, well, first, I just wanna thank everyone for, for joining us today. Um, I think uh, we've got a lot of work in front of us, right? Um, there, we are in the midst of some serious challenges. But when I reflect upon the last four years, um, to me, I think the the word that really comes to mind is is grit. You know, we've been really pressing ahead in the face of some really terrible headwinds for the past four years. And after yesterday, the the word that really came to my mind in this moment was hope. Uh, we continue to be in, in, a, in a hard spot, but I am very hopeful about where we can go from here. So um, I'm just so grateful to, to be in this work with all of you and uh, really excited to, to continue to partner with you to, to, see, uh, to see what we can do and really advance that peace and, and justice agenda in Washington. 
And I'll, I'll just join Amelia in thanking you all for your incredible work, your support, your advocacy in helping us. As I've said many times, nothing we do would be effective without the work that you're doing. And now with the change in control of, of Congress or of the Senate anyway, and with a new administration, we just have a lot more opportunities for progress. So we're, we're really excited and so happy you're here with us. I am happy you're here with us and I'm thrilled that we have Diana and Amelia in leadership at FCNL um, and really uh, helping to steer these teams forward. Um, I don't wanna leave without saying thank you for your financial support. We have a lot of people on this call who are contributors to this work and that's also essential to the work we do. So we thank you for that. Um, and we thank you for those of you who pray for us or send your warm intentions and wishes. We thank you for that as well. Um, and that's important to our work. We are a faith-based organization and, and I work with a lot of faith colleagues. And um, this is an administration that's paying attention to those voices. And that's, that's exciting for us as well. Um, and we work with a lot of people who aren't faith-based. And so it's one of the riches of FCNL. We have many issues to work on and we have many opportunities and uh, you're a vital part of that. So thank you so much for joining us. We will be doing another Thursdays with Friends in two weeks. Um, we have an invitation out, so I can't tell yet who it is because we have to waiting for confirmation. But um, each, each time we meet, we'll focus on a particular issue that we believe is really relevant, both to our FCNL legislative priorities, but to all of you in, as Amelia said, your pursuit of peace and justice. So again, thank you so much and um, look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks.